Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Sean T. And today we are going to enhance your ability to trust and believe in sex with Emily. Oh, my goodness. A few weeks back, I was on the podcast, Sex with Emily, and we had such an incredible conversation. I don't think I've ever felt freer to talk about sex. And y'all know I love me some sex talk and I love my wine nights. But it was just so informative and amazing. And the conversation we had was so great. But I wanted to bring her on my podcast because I want you guys to trust and believe in your ability to love yourself, enhance your relationships, and really not be afraid to talk about sex. So get ready to trust and Believe. Somebody say, oh, yeah. no, no, no. What's up? Better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Emily, oh my goodness. I'm so happy. I could say it again and again and again. I could repeat this 18,000 times. I'm so happy to have you here today. Mm, so happy to be here with you. Sean T, really, when you were on the Sex with Emily podcast, it was such we had never met. And we just had like this instant connection. And you really helped so much my audience by being so open and real about your relationship and your own you know challenges and how you've gotten more confident in your body i've like full-on quoted you said so thank you and i'm honored to be on your show to talk more about it sex how do we all get more comfortable speaking of comfortable it's not a big deal but it's not a big deal to talk about but it is a big deal when it comes to like you know enhancing your relationship people have been married for a while to be able to like pleasure yourself i think in that sense you know obviously you know it is a big deal but it's not it's a, a big, big deal, deal to make it norm you know make right. it norm. that's what i mean it's a big deal for everyone which is why i have a job because it's so it's so terrifying for most people but i want everyone to feel like it's not a big deal that it's comfortable like talking about the weather like sunny with a chance of orgasms right like just like that's fine like just why not that's so easy after a while Oh but my gosh. You pick I enough love to it. carry out and maybe we could, you know, have some anal. I don't know. It's anal August, by the way. Exactly. So. And I love that. So <laughs> I do want you to tell people what happened after our podcast. You know, I felt so comfortable with Emily that. Okay. So Shanti, we were texting because we're like, we really have to continue this relationship. We had like good vibes. I feel like we just, we, we know we want to hang out, but also it was just, what I love is a wonderful interview where you just connect and we connected, but then the audience is also like learning and it was great. And then we were talking, what you shared with me was that with you and Scott, right? Scott, your husband. Yeah. You said that you had, you took photos and it was one of your, part of your um, arousal cycle is that you have photos around your house that are just these beautiful, elegant photos of you guys. And then you said you're doing another photo shoot. You said, let me, do you mind if I share? I want to share with you these recent photos. I'm like, please. And they are so hot. These <laughs> photos of you, I was like, now I understand. And we are close and they were amazing. I just remember being like, um, I just want to make sure your partner doesn't mind that I'm sending you these photos. I don't want him to get upset. <laughs> no, he was, he was, no. My partner is so open and cool. Kind of like how your relationship is. No, he's, he's, he's down. I loved it. No, I was like, and I felt so much closer they're right here i mean come on people haven't seen these yet like i, I mean really <laughs> yes oh they saw they saw a couple of they those. saw the butt they, butt. i know they haven't audience. seen that they haven't seen that one but you can put it up to the screen <laughs> i don't care yes wow. maybe i'll give them something maybe i'll give them that good good when i, I post mean, about this. i like was so blown yeah i was excited for this so thank you for sharing that what else do i need to show you I well i wanted to it. say i wanted to say before you went further and further because we could talk about that <laughs> and photos all day but i want people i mean there are still probably some people listening that's just kind of like oh like they're talking about sex and like okay you're free to talk about it so why did you even start the sex with emily podcast in the first place like many people i grew up without any sex education sex was really taboo i was having sex i was in relationships and i realized that sex just wasn't as satisfying it seems to me like everybody else was having amazing sex and that they were having orgasms and pleasure all the time. And I was like, hello, am I the only one that thinks sex, sex is okay? Like it's not always what it could be. I knew there was something else to sex. So I really started this podcast 17, 18 years ago, really interviewing people. Cause I thought, well, 
it was the first year of podcasting and I always been very curious about sex. And I started about like, how do people have great sex? Cause when people would say to me last night, sex was amazing. I would be like, since I was young, 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 I would stop people and say, what do you mean by amazing sex? Like, like, did you have 16 orgasms? Was his penis double jointed? Like, well, what do you mean by great sex? And people were like, oh, well, you know, we were connected or it was whatever. So I just wanted to understand it because I figured like so much of us grow up where we start having sex and there's really no information and maybe we just, what we see in porn, it's just not accurate. So I started interviewing people about their sex lives and their relationships. And I came to find out pretty early on that most people didn't have any sex education. They were having great sex at the beginning of a relationship because you can have great sex at the beginning of any relationship. That's the attraction and the newness. But then after a while, people were stuck. And I realized that most people were in the stuck place of, I've been with someone for a while, like once they were with somebody and then they thought it's not so great. How do we communicate about it? Or then all these other things came up. People have a lot of shame around their bodies. They think their body's not doesn't look the way it should, not responding the way it should. And then I realized there was all these questions that were going unanswered and there really wasn't any other people, anyone talking about it. So I went back to grad school and I got my doctorate in human sexuality and I've been helping people do that ever since. And it's a journey. I'm, I'm always I'm still learning. Yeah. Thank you for going back and getting that degree. Because I'm, I'm telling you, and I said this on your podcast, like, just listening to you and explain things. And I think what's really great is for people who are afraid to talk about it, you explain it in such a scientific way that it just, it just makes you feel great. And I love when I go to your Instagram and you have posted something and, and there is conversation about it and it's no shame about mm -hmm. it. And that's the thing that I wanted to say, cause you mentioned something a little bit ago. I think like in relationships, you know, we start out and it's like, oh my gosh, like I remember Scott and I used to have sex six times a day and it was <laughs> right. like, we would celebrate that and like, you know, it would just be this amazing thing. And then, I mean, we, I will say that we have a, an incredible sex life still, not six times a day. I'm like, I can't, he could probably do it. <laughs> I can't. And he's older than me. So I don't even know what. I don't know what water that's another in podcast Seattle, <laughs> right. which you, you will come on my wine night and we will discuss that to the to the um yeah. degree but um i think that something was important is that these conversations like if you drive down the street and there's a you know there's a traffic jam can you imagine how many people are in their car they're they're one of their miserable moments is because they haven't had sex there with their spouse and they're you know, craving somebody else. So they're like having this affair on the side. And it's not even like, I mean, and it's literally an affair because they haven't been able to connect with their, with their spouse. So they feel like they have to like go somewhere else to express this. Like, do you ever mm -hmm. hear stories like that? All the time. Yeah. That people think that something's wrong with them. Something's broken. I mean, really, that's, that's really what it is. It's like, no one tells us that there is something called the honeymoon phase and it is a biological state that lasts anywhere from six months to two years in a new relationship. Cause we have that cocktail of the most delicious hormones that are just floating around and you're so connected. It's amazing. But like everything after a while, like a high, right? When we get high, you got to come back down again. And I think that we're always very surprised that we're not actually prepared for it. So just preparing for it, understanding that keeping that connection going, well, it might not be six times, a day, which I think a lot of us can relate to the beginning of the relationship, you're ripping <laughs> each other. My mom actually used to joke about this with my stepdad when they got together. She's like, we used to, every time we come, yes, we talk about this in my family now. She's like, we'd rip each other's clothes off. And then one time he came in and I made him a sandwich. And she's like, you know, before we did that, she's like, and then he'd open the mail and then he'd make a sandwich. And then the sex didn't, you know, it's like that life creeps in. And so then we just don't feel that same way, but it doesn't mean that the connection and the energy and intimacy has to end. It just means that we have to prioritize it. We have to prioritize our sex life. Like we prioritize our workouts. We prioritize our health. We prioritize our religion. You know, like how many days a week you have to work out to feel good or what you need to eat to feel good. And I think with sex, that's the one thing that's just as important. You know, it is part of your health and wellness, but we don't quite know how to troubleshoot when this things happen. So we start seeking another high in somebody else, that really mm. hot barista, or, you know, this friend, my friend's partner at this party is really hot. And we start looking outside of our relationship to get that charge and that thrill again, when really the beauty and the sexiness and the deepest, hottest intimacy comes from working on it with your partner. I agree. I mean, 
I agree. And I'll keep it very real. Scott and I have been together 12 years, so we've had some experiences that involve more people than us. However, it's never the same. It's almost like it's fun. You know, all that is like super fun, but it's almost like it just doesn't compare. And it's it's really interesting because, <laughs> oh, my God, I'll need you to meet Scott. So I can't wait. You know, I walk around pretty much in next to nothing all day. They have a tank top, nothing, or tights or some short ass shorts. Like I'm just, and Scott will see me and I'll be out here with, you know, our friends or, you know, our team. And then I'll go in the house and say, you know, I'm taking a shower. And Scott will send me a text message with some photo from his hidden album. And he'd be like, you know, just in case you need help in the shower, just let me know. And I'm like, I'm already on it. Like, I'm already, <laughs> like, setting the scene because I already know. And, you know, like, our nannies are here. Our kids are in the, the uh, like, in the other side of the house. I'm like, I got to close the door. I got to turn on the speakers in the shower. And I'm like, this is just what we're going to do. And uh, the reason why I say that is because we, you know, while we've had, like, many sexual experiences, we're, like, super free, free sexually. We definitely have like incredible ways to keep our relationship strong. And another thing I wanted to tell you is, um, so one of the other things that we have for our bedroom now is uh, we bought, well, actually Elliot, who is my apparel manager, but he was like, you know, I think this, he helped me design my house. And he goes, you know, I think this would be really great in, mm -hmm. in your house. And it's this book of just like hot, nude pretty much black men on the beach. And so, you know, within a week of us living in our house, I handed Scott this book. I was like, so what do you think about this book? You know, it was at bedtime and it just like, so it's just like finding ways to keep it fun, to keep it interesting and, it, and to keep it connected. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what that's was, was so inspiring. And I think that that's when you shared all these stories, people have to find what that is in their relationship. Cause for some couples, it's just that maybe it's just sending pictures of yourself or a body part that you feel that makes you feel sexy or a sexy text. Like I always see like foreplay all day or foreplay starts after the last orgasm, right? How do you continue to keep that spark be alive in the relationship? So it's fodder. Like what I love is it, and we talked about this on the show that you've all this, like the visual stimuli for you, like that's your arousal. And that's for many of us. Like we have to see something hot or we have to like, you know, some of us need to think about something like you could send your, you know, sometimes I send my partner like a, a voice memo with like me talking about something and he thinks that's hot, like my voice or a photo, you know, we just find up, you know, we find what it is. We find like yeah. what those things are, but those are the little things that you do in a relationship. And if you don't know how fun to talk about it, like say to your partner, because people are going, I don't know what that is. We're already at the dead end. I don't want to have sex. Okay. Well, think about the most memorable time you've had sex. Like what was happening before that? Were you on vacation somewhere? Was were you looking watching a sexy film, a sexy porn together? Were you had a cocktail? Like find your own like arousal DNA. Right. And I also I love that you said that too, because I also hate when people I and I don't use the word hate that much, but I do <laughs> hate it in this respect is when they put all women and all men in the same boat of how they become like they're like like if you talk to people, they're like, oh, well, women need to go out on a date. I'm like, not all the women I know. No. Like some women just want to shut it down. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's and not all guys are exactly the same. No. I understand the difference, but um, I just want to make reference to that because I don't like when they put like our genders. It's like men are like this and women are like this. I'm like, I know I have some female friends. <laughs> This is so bad. <laughs> this is not bad. This is amazing. But I have a female friend, like, I literally will send her pictures of me because I know it's shock value. And she responds, like, as if she was a gay man. She'd be like, bitch. Like, you know, <laughs> she's like, but because it's just like, it's, it's, it's silly and it, it is hot and it's fun <laughs> and it's, it is just ridiculous. To piggyback on what you're saying, like, my boyfriend, when we first started dating, like, our first three dates, he planned all these elaborate, like, he was taking me on dates and dinners and out to things. And I was like, and like our fourth date or something is like, can we do something else? We, we've already nailed like dinner and a thing. Like, why don't we just, can, can you make me dinner at your house or something? I'd love to see where you, like, I just, I'm not into that. I don't need to be that. But some people are like, if they don't take me out and buy me a meal, like I'm not into it. So we all have to figure out what that is. And I want to give, yeah, people permission to do that, that there is no, you don't have to fit into any formula. Like how, that's what's so great about sex is that I think that we have such limited information about it. So then we go off of what people think we should be doing or what we see in porn. And we don't get to like, we don't go internally and think, well, what, 
what has actually turned me on? What's gotten me the most aroused? You know, what has my partner done? What do I need? So it's fun to play with that. I also want to talk about the expectation of real life intimacy in your bedroom and how it doesn't necessarily correlate with porn itself and not, and like tell people not to get mixed up. So I wanted to see if you could chat on that a bit. The problem is many of us don't see other portrayals of sex anywhere. And then all we really see is porn and we're like, well, that must be how sex is, or that's how people, what people want. And yes, porn is a, it's a script, just like a movie you go you watch on TV. It's a scripted scene based on um, what the director thinks that might be hot for that person or for that group or what other kinds of porn was trending. So we're going to make more films of this ilk and also the, yeah, they're acting and they are cheating towards camera and they've got makeup on their body parts and everything is sort of, you know, they're in costume essentially, even if they're naked, like they are, it is a, you are watching a scripted scene that is about highlights of sex. Like what, but someone might think in extreme fantasy, this is what I want to go down, but it doesn't show people like putting on a condom, using lube, stopping to go to the bathroom, that sex gets messy sometimes, right? The phone rings, the kids come in, the dogs are barking. Like, it's just, you stop and start, stop and start. Like, can we just normalize that? That sex isn't always so linear too. Sometimes you like can start fooling around and then you're like, I'm hungry, let's make a sandwich and go back to sex. Like, it's not just like this beautiful, like thing that you see that's executed in porn at all. So I, I just always that, wanna yeah. remind people of that, that, um, it's fun for titillation. It's fun for arousal. I mean, come on, porn is so fun to watch. Let's like eliminate for a second someone else. And let's talk about like sex with ourselves. Because okay. I think the other thing that's like super taboo is people don't even like to admit that they masturbate. Like as a as a teenager, you know, me and my friends would be in a, like, I remember I went on a trip with my friends. It was a school trip and us teenage boys were like doing what we did in our hotel room and be like, went down and you know we had one of us mm -hmm. acted like we were 18 and paid to get the porn on the tv and it's, it's yeah. like but everyone was like and then someone found out about it and they were like oh my gosh like sean and i'm not going to name other people they were like you know whatever and everyone like immediately roped us into being gay and they were like oh they're gay because they were together i'm like oh well i'm the only one that's gay but i was very happy in that room <laughs> that i was the only one the reason why i say that is because but really it was like people were trying to shame us for like pleasuring ourselves but you do hear men talk about it more than women openly oh, yeah. so let's talk about like loving your body pleasuring yourself and being like yes live your best life in that space too i'm so glad you brought this up because it is one of my favorite topics because we're all going to masturbate or we all should and it is still really taboo and so i'm really on this I've been working a lot about like some sex education right now for parents to like talk to their kids when they're younger to normalize it and say, this is going to happen. And this is what happens when you go through puberty. And, you know, that's like one of my missions, but we're not there yet. Most of us, a lot of us still have shame about it. So yes, yeah, especially men, men. Okay. So when men masturbate, like you see like fast times at Ridgemont high or porkies or all the things that we grew up on. Um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, American <laughs> pie, right? Like men just going to put their penis in any hole they can find. Like there's a hole. I'm going to stick my penis in it. But for women, you're like, uh, honestly, I never even knew about masturbation. Didn't even occur to me to masturbate until I was like having sex already in my twenties. And my friends were like, I was like, sex isn't okay. Not great. And they're like, like, have you had an orgasm? Have you ever masturbated? I was like, no, I didn't even know what it was. And I didn't like grow up on the, in the middle of nowhere. Like, I grew up in Michigan. We had like television. I learned stuff. I just didn't know about it. Till this day though, still, there are so many people, women especially, that I need to remind them that actually masturbation is part of a really healthy, like your self-care, your overall health and wellness. It actually improves your mood. It can help with PMS. It can help strengthen your immune system. Like there's all these ways that having an orgasm and connecting to yourself helps your overall well-being and definitely helps your sex life. So I really try to normalize that and remind people like my mantra is like meditate, masturbate, manifest. Like even my guys are always like, okay, this morning, like you did your mass, you did your manifestation and you did, you didn't do your masturbation. I'm like, no time for that. But I try to remember it at least every day or at night, I keep a vibrator in my shower. So it's like top of mind, <laughs> yeah. like guys, I don't always have to remind them. They're like, I'm like, dude, you're a Walgreens. Like you don't need to masturbate with women. I have to remind them sometimes. So, um, yeah, it's important. It's part of self-care. It also, here's the other thing. 
is that I want to remind people that sex begets sex. So if you're not in a relationship, which my show, I talk to people, you know, all different stages of life in relationships, out of relationships, people often think, well, I'm not, I don't need to masturbate or I'm not in the mood. And, and you have to remember that because you haven't done it in a while. Again, I liken it to working out like sex begets sex. The more you masturbate, the more orgasms you have, the more you feel comfortable in your body, the more you're going to want to do it, the more you're going to have that sexual energy flowing through you that you're going to feel like you're going to, you're going to be out there ready to meet somebody, but even to, you know, meet yourself with it. Cause we lose touch with our bodies. We lose touch with our sexual connection to ourselves. So, and it's an important thing to keep going in masturbation practice, whether you're in a relationship or not. So even in relationships, some people say to me, Oh, I don't need to, cause I have my partner. And it's like, that's why you might need to even more, right? So take time for yourself or do it yeah. together. I love that. So Scott and I, we will ask each other if we did have our personal moments. <laughs> um, because I don't know, there's, it's something like, I just want to know, because it, it definitely like, if he hasn't, I know, the experience is just like a little bit different, because there's been like some time in between there. But mm -hmm. you know, I the only so there's two things here, I try not to <laughs> masturbate too much because I like and I don't know. <laughs> right. I like the whole like edging experience. Like mm -hmm. I like to keep myself at a heightened place for three or four days because that makes me when he and I do get together, it heightens the experience even more and it it makes it like I it's weird because I'm at a heightened sexual arousal experience, I get to enjoy him more. But I mean, that's me. I mean, I do have moments to myself and I know he has moments, but those individual moments, if we don't, you know, have that orgasm, if you will, it like brings us to a place of like, kids are in the bed. You know, I haven't bought the sex <laughs> swing yet, but I've imagined that it's there. And like, you know what I mean? Cause, yeah. and that's the other thing I want to say is it is healthy. I did want to say this and, you know, being a 44 year old man, like it's weird, not weird for me to be 44, but now to be 44 and being and having conversations with other men. Like I met this guy in the elevator who was seemingly straight because he was with a woman and they were together. And he just looked at my body and he was like, um, oh my gosh, you know, what do you do to work out? And I was like, mm -hmm. initially I'm like, okay, there's going to be a workout conversation. And it really turned into self-love, how being 44, like feeling strong. And then we actually got into conversations about erections it was like the craziest <laughs> elevator conversation you ever had i'm like only fucking me like i'm the only person this would ever happen to it was interesting because i got out the elevator and we kept talking about it and we started talking about testosterone therapy and the whole thing so i start and that that was the first of like a few random conversations that i had with guys and now that i go to the gym it's even more you know people seem yeah. view me as like this free person and i'm you know i'm sexually free i'm personality free or whatever anyway i say all that to say is i did get a call from a, a company and they wanted me to test out a cock ring and and that's what it's called uh and so it's you know i, I had a meeting with the guy and anyway we just kind of talked about you know if you don't use it you lose it and we were talking about erections and I was like, man, I want to like have a retreat with mid forties men yes. to talk about this stuff because people are so afraid, you know, females too, in certain situations yep. and men don't want to talk about what happens as you get older. So let's talk about like the changes in the body, the hormones in the body. First, I want to say one thing about heterosexual relationships, I think are different edging and like waiting for ejaculation for men as they get older. This is where the difference is. And it's going to circle back to hormones. They often say it's better to ejaculate less like less frequently over the age of 30 than 40 like once a week and if you think about certain practices say like you could learn to kind of orgasm without ejaculation that's a whole other practice so it is a little bit different i guess i'm talking about in relationships oftentimes where there's women who don't understand when their male hug partners masturbate and they so i was kind of encouraging them so no shame in masturbation is all i'm saying people should be free to sexually explore their bodies because it does make their orgasms better and that's how you learn like that's the other thing is that it's exploratory the reason why you masturbate is i don't think i would have as strong orgasms and as, as great of sex with partner with my partner if i didn't take the time to know my body what feels good because i think yeah. it's a little bit sometimes more confusing for 
vulva owners because we're like, there's a lot going on there. We got to figure out. So, yeah. yes. God, that's good mess. Okay. Talk. Okay. So testosterone. Testosterone and, hormones. <laughs> yes. I know this. And it's just right now there's so many great like replacement, hormone replacement therapies that for, for men and for women. And I do think even when we've lost some testosterone uh, over like with perimenopause, through menopause, um, which for women can last about 15, 10, you know, what is it, like eight to 12 years. And then for men too, it starts to decline year over year and it will impact your, your erections. It, 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 and so will blood flow. So you got to keep healthy, you got to keep moving your body. But I do think that um, testosterone therapy and hormone therapy has been very, very, is proven to be very helpful. And it's still in its infant stages, though. I feel, feel like it's, you know, you still got to pay out of pocket a lot of times. And there's a lot more information you have to find. But it can be a game changer for your sex drive, for your focus, for your body, for the way you work out, for the way you feel. What's been your experience with it? I actually got testosterone pellets. So a lot of people either do testosterone lotion where they rub on their scrotum. Mm -hmm. Or some people rub it on their chest, and then some people take the shots. So Scott takes the shots in his butt, mm -hmm. and I just got the pellets in my back because it's kind of like a slow release. And then I get my blood work like every 75 days to kind of like okay. test it out. My mood changed, like it enhanced. Like I'm pretty much always in a good mood, but it definitely enhance my mood and my happy feeling. And I felt more balanced. Um, one of the things that I did have to work through was like my E2, which is your estradiol, which is your estrogen. My estrogen was a little high. So then I had to take an estrogen blocker to like kind of balance it out. So like, you know, I was going through a bunch of like, so my hormones were a little bit out of whack and I didn't. And then I had like, obviously high stress pre-surgery. So I've just kind of been on this like health kick and really what it comes down to is, and I had a conversation with a doctor a few days ago, your hormones can dictate really the longevity of your life in general. And obviously with that, it enhances your, your freedom to be yourself, your, your self, um, you know, expression, which then gets your confidence. And when you have more confidence, it can translate transfer into the bedroom as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's very, very liberating. I have to say that I've also had the pellets. They're freaking awesome. It's a lot of work. I mean, so because for women too, it's balancing your, your testosterone, your estrogen, um, and your progesterone. I mean, the thing is, is that it's a lot of work. Like for there's a lot of different doctors to see and I'm still trying to they all have different beliefs around what levels are normal for your testosterone range for a woman of a certain age. And a lot of doctors won't do it. They think the pellets. So I feel like there's the pellets, there's the creams, there's the tablets that you can put under your tongue. There's, and I've kind of tried them all. I feel like I've been a guinea pig the last few years. And for me, the pellets were the best because they, you could set it and forget it. Like you there, you have to think about doing something every single day. Yep. The risk to the pellets are that, um, you know, yeah, you can't alter it if there's too much, you can't really, can't go down or up. I guess you could take the blockers to try to decrease the impact of it. But I also found that it helped with my moods and helped with my focus, helped with sex drive. Um, I haven't even talked about this on my show yet because I'm waiting to kind of like, I wanted to gather the, I wanted to kind of cool. get as much information as I could. Yeah. So here we go. We're all revealing stuff here. But I think that, <laughs> but I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there too, that if you do that, that um, I don't know that people, there's a lot of cancer scares I know about women. Who, and I think a lot of that has been unfair. I don't want to say for sure. I mean, I'm not a, a doctor and a medical doctor, but I think there's a lot of fear around it. And I think that if you see a doctor who's educated in this area and you gather more information that it's less risk than you think. And yes, hormones contribute to so many factors that we never even really understood until the last few years. I think there's been like three or four books that have come out just in the last year or two about hormones and uh, and your sex drive, which no one really, again, it was kind of a mystery, but the fact that we can play with it now and, and how it's so much better than maybe uh, popping a pill for something else that, that a lot of times where it's symptoms, but really the underlying thing is hormones. So if you can find yeah. a place to regulate them, get your blood work. I just, again, I just want to tell everyone that there's a lot of misinformation, like the way you get measure your hormones too, like there's certain days of month that you should do like blood work, right? There's certain times a month you should do it there. Some people think you could do like a saliva test or you could do like a pee test or there's just, there's just different ways. There's different theories, but I think it's kind of like the wild west right now is how I'm experiencing the hormone world is that it's yeah. not as, it's not as set that this is the process that this is the procedure to follow. What do you, what have you found? 
Right. Yeah. I, well, it's very interesting. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that, because I think what I'm going to say is going to kind of co-sign on your experience. But once I started lifting weights and going on a bodybuilding journey, which is so crazy that I'm finding it hard to to gain weight, I always found it very easy to gain weight till now. But being in that journey and, you know, my eating and, you know, all of that mixed with the like hormone therapy, it like, first of all, it just enhanced my mood almost mm -hmm. all the time. I don't get the like tired dips during the day, like this, all of that. But specifically to women, what I've learned through, you know, obviously my doctors, and I've also learned through women who have experienced testosterone firsthand. One of the things that I found to be really incredible is something we were talking about earlier when um, a lot of times I've heard people complain that either they're not sexually, they're not sexually stimulated with their husband, or I've heard from guys like, yeah, my girl doesn't want to have sex. And I had a friend that told me the same thing and she started taking testosterone and, you know, she had her own, all her reasons for taking it. But one of the things she said to me, she was like, I'm so happy I take it because mine and my husband's sex life has like dramatically increased. And she was like, you know, I always loved him. I was always like into him. I always find him to be super sexy and attractive. But she was like, I wasn't able to find that switch to make me want to be what I like to call mm -hmm. animalistic. Yes. Um, you know, and so that was another thing. Now, women in the gym who take it, they always say like, people just think it's so they think it's crazy because people say, Oh, like you're taking steroids. And they're like, little, no. little do they know, not only does it make you stronger, not only does it enhance your mood, enhance your your sex, but it just like everyone just talks about how like happy they are. And it's like, you know, but they also said, you know, you have to be careful because people who don't have a naturally really nice personality, it's like <laughs> they have to manage it better. But if you're naturally a nice person, you take that testosterone and it enhances your ability. But then you have to get all the blood work. Like you said, they you like have to most regulate people, it. Mm -hmm. Most people, most of these people get blood work every 30 days. And I found it to be interesting because in the health world it's like get your blood work once a year i'm like no like yes. i love getting my blood work every 75 so days because now i'm just like you know i can just kind of like see how i'm feeling and like act on it right away right it tells a story it really does tell a story like i just talked to my doctor right too i'm like okay so let's look at my estrogen over the last three months let's look at my testosterone and that tells a lot because also for women you know i think the estrogens also plays a big factor because if it's too high you know you can have you know, more mood swings, or you could have like night sweats because of the progesterone. Like there's all these things that happen that you can actually regulate with hormones and everyone's different. Like how testosterone might work on me could be different on somebody else. And for me, my experience was less about sex drive, but more about focus and mood and like sharpness and energy. Mm. And that's where I saw a difference. And like my body working out all that, like it felt it was really a, a game changer. And I first heard about it like 10 years ago, because it wasn't the pellets weren't around that but maybe they've been around, but now they're becoming more commonplace. But when I was on Love Line with Dr. Drew Pinsky, and I thought it was really like, I trust him so much. And he was like, his wife had an early perimenopause and went through it. And I was like, oh my God, this is a thing. So I really, you know, felt safe doing it. Now, the more research I've done and talked to people and, yeah. um, and other doctors and practitioners, I think it's just something to look into, not for everybody, but it's, it's um, there's a lot of great options out there right now. So obviously we know you from your podcast and your education and you, you know, what you offer to the world, but outside of that, is there anything else you're working on? Do you actually, do you do any one-on-one -on -one or group, you know, mentoring or activities to help people? I want, if, if that's available, I would love for people to be able to find you because I know there are going to be people out there who are afraid to talk before that are going to come to you or maybe send you a message and just be like, wait a minute, help me out here. People can always send questions to feedback at sexwithemily.com. If you have any sex questions, we answer my podcast. You can leave me a voicemail to leave a voicemail number. You could do that. I don't see people one on one right now, but I am working on a book right now about pleasure. I am doing a show about sex education. It's all time. It's all, you know, sort of together. I'm not seeing, I think the best way to find me is a uh, do all my social media, which is sex with Emily, but I'm, I am doing a group, an education group too, for young people before they go to college about teaching them like basic sex ed skills. 
um, we're just starting that this pilot group, but really it's mostly about my book right now, my podcast, which is really going to change the way people think about their, the book specifically is about prioritizing pleasure and how to do that, that it's showing you people's formulas for actually putting more pleasure into your life. And I don't just mean sex. I mean, like we're, we're in such a productivity culture that we work so hard, we work so hard, and then we don't like leave enough for ourselves and for things that make us feel good. So it's ways to kind of work pleasure into your life. I cannot wait to read that because I actually just finished reading a book called Cafe on the Edge of the World. I'm not sure if you read it. I talked about it in my other podcast. I'm just like so obsessed with this book. Cafe on the Edge of the World is an amazing story in there that talks about how people do wait to enjoy their lives. And I'm like, why are you waiting? I, I know why you're waiting. It's, it's not you, but you understood. I know why people are waiting because of exactly what you said. We are productive culture where it's like, especially, I don't, I don't, I think here in the U S it's almost like overly done. Like our food is extra. We work way too long and all this stuff, but you know, the book kind of really tries to help you find your perfect purpose for existing. But within that to start enjoying life right now, it's like, why are we waiting till we're 55, 65 years old to then go on vacation when our energy while we hope it's going to be still the same is like, why can't we do it now? Like, why, why are you waiting? Like, like, and I'm like, have, I'm like, have sex, go on vacation, go get a massage, you know, go for a walk during the day in the middle of the day. Like, you know, I'm like such a, I'm a big fan of people doing something often to, to find their, to pleasure in their life. So I cannot wait. You have to come back on the show when the book is out because we're going to talk about it. Of course. Yeah. And I, I want to say what the reframe in the book is that pleasure is productivity actually. And that was the big mm. reset that like the more pleasure, the more things you do, massage, walk, all the seeing your friends that actually is productive because it's going to impact every other area of your life that you're going to feel like you have more energy, more time. You're not going to feel like you're just working until this, until you retire. And it just kind of helps you do it at pleasure now rather than pleasure later. So anyway, yes, I'll let you come. I'll come out and we'll talk about it. Or somewhere else. We'll find a way. <laughs> exactly. Well, Emily, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Make sure you all go check out the podcast, Sex with Emily. It is so good. Her voice is really soothing. And she keeps it all the way real. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>